Weeks as the sixth president of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago. Madam Speaker, as a young nation, we can indeed be proud of the fact that our democracy and all our governance systems are open to all our citizens. Today, for the first time, a woman is set to hold the highest office in the land. Madam Speaker, I still remember the excitement I experienced as a boy when I saw the first woman bus driver. I distinctly remember the pride I felt when we produced the first female commercial pilot. And only recently, those moments returned when I saw a picture of our first female commercial airline captain, now retired, as she lit up the pages of our national newspapers. As a man with a wife, with sisters, daughters, a granddaughter, female cousins, nieces, and thousands of females whom I represent, I feel especially pleased and proud to be in this. But let us not forget, Madam Speaker, that we in Trinidad and Tobago are no strangers to having women hold high office. My colleague is representative of that. The tapestry of our nation's history is woven with life threads of many formidable women who have helped this nation to develop, to thrive, to overcome, and to soar. While many of them may have been well known and their names recorded in history books, countless others would have in the past and continue each and every day to do human service in helping to build our nation in their homes, on the sporting fields, at their places of work, and throughout their communities. I see this, Madam Speaker, as the perfect opportunity for the young people of our nation to sit up and take notice. This is a fitting time, as good a time as any, for our young people and indeed each and every citizen to recommit to being the best that we can be. Justice Weeks' story serves as a living example that nothing is beyond our reach in Trinidad. The simple truth is that hard work, dedication, discipline, and good character in this land of Trinidad and Tobago, no accomplishment, no accolade, no position is beyond the reach of anyone. Good woman that she is, today she is selected and celebrated only because she was deemed to be the best person for the job. The words from Prime Minister Dr. Keith Rowley commending Justice Paula May Weeks after the Electoral College endorsed her nomination as President-elect. Good morning, I'm Sandra Maraj, and it's a historic day in Trinidad and Tobago, as in just one hour, the nation will welcome the first woman to hold the highest office in the land. President-elect Justice Paula May Weeks will take the oath of office, becoming the sixth president of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago. Welcome to Understanding the Presidency, in this segment, we seek to examine the history, legacy, role, and function of the president as we journey from Sir Ellis Clark to the outgoing His Excellency, President Anthony Carmona. Well, with me today to discuss this further is Director of the Institute of Social and Economic Studies at the University of the West Indies, Dr. Hamid Ghani. Dr. Ghani, welcome. Thank you. Well, let's journey a little way back to when we first became a republic. Uh, we, we celebrate Republic Day on September 24th, but that's the nation officially became a republic on August 1st, 1976, with President Sir Ellis Clark. What would have prompted then Prime Minister Dr. Eric Williams and his cabinet to take that road from independence to take us to republicanism? Well, I think that um, in order to understand the 1976 move, we need to understand that in 1969, the government had um, moved to establish some kind of constitutional reform proposal 
and in the throne speech of 1969, Sir Solomon Hochoy, the then Governor General, uh, read into the records um, certain things with regard to this, and then the government set up a joint select committee, and uh, it was obvious that the government was on a track to engage in constitutional reform. After the 1970 uprisings, um, there was a general election in 1971 in which the PNM won all 36 seats. And at the opening of Parliament, Sir Solomon Ho Choi, um, in reading the throne speech, indicated that the government was going to set up a constitution commission mm -hmm. under the chairmanship of Sir Hugh Wooding. And that commission met between 1971 and submitted a report in January of 1974. And in December of 1974, Dr. Williams largely disagreed with the report, and that is widely recorded in the Hansard of December 14th and 17th, 1974. And as a consequence of that, um, a number of things began to happen. He appointed Wilfred McKell to receive comments uh, on that draft constitution. And then by 1976, the constitution bill had come to parliament after a joint select committee had been established. So there was a long road that was walked, but Williams was clearly on the pathway towards having a Republican system, not departing too much from the Westminster Whitehall model, but changing Queen Elizabeth II as Queen of Trinidad and Tobago and replacing her with an indigenously elected president. Um, so that we were independent from 62 to 76 with Queen Elizabeth II as our head of state in her, in her personal capacity, not mm -hmm. as Queen of the United Kingdom, but as Queen of Trinidad and Tobago. Uh, but that changed in 1976 and we got our own president. So Williams was committed to this from a long time, since about 1969, he had this on his agenda. But I think it was fast-tracked after the 1970 uprisings and the fact that he won all of the seats in 1971 which facilitated his ability to do it. Mm -hmm. So that would have been some measure of constitution reform. Yes, right? yes. It was a big, big, big um, constitutional reform step. Right. And we're at that point again mm -hmm. um, where, well, some years ago, we started looking at the possibility of constitution reform again. Mm -hmm. What would be different? Well, I, I think that... The late Prime Minister Patrick Manning had started to have a discussion about an executive presidency where he was seeking to have the powers of the Prime Minister merge with the powers of the President because the President right now exercises his or her powers uh, on the advice of the Cabinet, largely speaking, and there are exceptions. There are two exceptions. One is an exception for acting after consultation mm -hmm. and the other is an exception for acting in his or her own deliberate judgment. Uh, or discretion, so that that is the, the differential. But the substantive part of the powers of the presidency are exercised on the advice of cabinet, but there are two main exceptions. Mm -hmm. And we'll come back to talking about the powers of the president, but let's get a clear um, understanding of the significance between independence and republicanism. I don't think people are too clear, and we often hear people saying, uh, why are we celebrating two days, Independence mm -hmm. Day and Republic Day? What is the difference? Right. Well, the difference is that on the 31st of August, 1962, we attained fully responsible status. That is, we ceased to be a, a colony or a possession of Great Britain. So that from that day forward, the 31st of August, 1962, we had fully responsible status, which meant that we could govern our own affairs. Our head of state was still Queen Elizabeth II, but her status changed in relation to us. Whereas she, before August 31st, 1962, she was Queen of Trinidad and Tobago in the sense that Trinidad and Tobago was part of Her Majesty's possessions and we were a colony. After 31st of August, 1962, um, we became a monarchy at independence and our monarch was Queen Elizabeth II in her person. So she acted on the advice of her Trinidad and Tobago ministers. Mm -hmm. So that that is, we were independent because Trinidad and Tobago ministers were formulating our own policies and she was the one uh, sort of acting in the name of the crown. And that is how it was being done. And the governor general was Her Majesty's personal representative in Trinidad and Tobago, just as the governor general is Her Majesty's personal representative in Canada and in Australia and in New Zealand and various mm -hmm. other parts of the Commonwealth where mm -hmm. she is queen. And even in some of our Caribbean nations Well, still. most of our common Caribbean countries, in, in nine of them, um, she is still queen of, of the country. So that um, when we became a republic in 1976, we abolished uh, the monarchy. Uh, and that meant that Queen Elizabeth II ceased to be our queen. And from the 1st of August, 1976, we became a republic with a president. So that Sir Ellis Clark, up to the 31st of July, 1976, 
was the Governor General of Trinidad and Tobago as Her Majesty's personal representative, and from the 1st of August 1976, the transitional provisions in the 1976 Constitution meant that whoever held the office of Governor General would become the first president. So by virtue of those transitional provisions, he became president of Trinidad and Tobago. We ceased to be a monarchy, and we became a republic with our own president. Mm -hmm. Was it a move that was welcomed generally um, by the country? Well, I think that after the 1970 uprisings, there was a certain energy in the country to have a greater degree of indigenous presence uh, institutionally. And um, the entire process of constitutional reform was one where you had a lot of discussions. The Wooding Commission went all around the country. The Wooding Commission recommended uh, a republic with a president mm -hmm. and so on. So I think that the, the energy was there and it eventually um, we exhaled in, in August of 1976, so to speak, uh, by becoming a republic. It was, it was long in the making, but these things are usually long in the making. Yeah. What is the role of the president? You know, many um, uh, people see the president, and um, I mean, and, and it has, be, has been said, the president is just a figurehead. Is he just a figurehead? What is exactly is his role and function? Well, I, I think that whereas before the governor general was ceremonial, I think that the president is quasi-ceremonial to the extent that um, powers of consultation that the president has means that he consults the prime minister and the leader of the opposition or he consults whichever other office he's required to consult in other situations. And then after that consultation, the president then makes up his or her own mind as to what the president will do. And then acting in his or her own deliberate judgment or discretion, uh, that is purely for the president to do. So that uh, many people, when they see in legislation that so and so shall be done by the president, they form the opinion that the president is the person, but that really means president on the advice of cabinet. Right. And in, in, in that context, the presidency has slightly more individual powers than did the governor general. And that is perhaps the qualitative change, that the category of consultation did not exist before August 1st, 1976. And it has certainly existed since August 1st, 1976. Is there any reason why we chose to go this way and not the way of Guyana? Because Guyana at the time had already um, been a republic and had a pres an executive presidency. Well, Guyana, in 1970, Guyana became a republic. So they changed the governor general for a president. The president of Guyana at that time was um, a, a sort of ceremonial type president. But in 1980, Guyana made the step to get an executive presidency. And uh, that was a big qualitative change so that um, the, the, the president then became the head of state, the commander in chief of the armed forces and the head of government. Uh, the office of prime minister still exists in Guyana but it is perhaps, but the Prime Minister sits in the National Assembly and to a large extent is the first Vice President, so to speak. So that the Prime Minister, in terms of title, is in the Parliament only, but is not to be confused with Prime Minister as we know it in the other Commonwealth Caribbean countries. Because there is a President who is an Executive President and who exercises his or her own powers in his or her own deliberate judgment, first and foremost. And then consultation and acting on the advice of others are the secondary ones. Whereas in our case, it's the other way around. around. Yeah. Okay. Well, we take a short break right now, but when we return, more from Dr. Ghani, and we'll also be joined by Dr. Chris Rampasad. Understanding the presidency will continue on CTV Talk City 91.1 FM and online at ctvtt.com. Stay tuned. I'm very happy to have been given this opportunity to speak today. My esteemed colleagues, today is truly a historic one for our country. For the first time in the history of our republic, Trinidad and Tobago has elected its first woman to serve as our nation's president. <laughs> On behalf of the opposition, I wish to welcome President-elect Weeks and express our confidence that she will discharge her duties and responsibilities as our head of state impartially and with compassion, striving at all times to enhance our democracy. Madam Chair, 41 years ago, Trinidad and Tobago adopted a Republican constitution, giving us the right to elect our own head of state, to govern ourselves and chart our own destiny as a sovereign nation. Significant progress has been made in building our democracy and our public institutions, 
but we have much to do to ensure that our citizens are adequately served. It gives me particular pleasure, Madam Speaker, as I'm sure it does for you, on this very historic juncture to be part of the process of electing the first female head of state. As she takes up her new position, we trust that President-elect Paula May Weeks will seek to protect the democratic rights and interests of the citizens of our beloved nation. Madam Chair, as I said, I'm very pleased to participate in this historic occasion as a woman of this distinction becomes our nation's sixth president. Many of us have long advocated for greater participation by women in politics and in leadership roles. It is our view that no society can achieve its potential until our women and girls, <coughs> side by side with our men and boys, take up leadership roles and contribute as equals in advancing national development. Equity at all levels will enhance our democracy and ensure that our nation achieves its true potential. As I close, Madam Chair, I'm certain that today's election of our country's first woman president will serve to inspire our girls and women. Today our girls can find examples of women, including your good self, at the highest levels of our nation's political sphere. And that is something we can all be immensely proud of. Welcome back. Well, that was Opposition Leader Kamala Pasad Bisesa welcoming President-elect Paula May Weeks after the Electoral College endorsed her nomination as the next president of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago. Well, now joining us this morning to discuss further the role of the president, along with Dr. Ghani, is educator, advocate of culture, gender, sensitive leadership, and author of Through the Political Glass Ceiling, Dr. Chris Rampasar. Dr. Rampasar, welcome. Well, we were discussing before you came in the role and function of the president, and one of the things we, we I want to discuss is the powers of the president. How powerful or what powers does the, pre does the president really have? We, has his role changed? We talked about him being considered just a figurehead at one point. But then remember Arthur N. R. Robinson and during the 1818 stalemate in parliament. How, were those powers changed at that point or did the president always have certain powers that we, you know, we were not aware of? Well, well, the president has always had the powers that the presidency has now. The, these powers have always existed. It's the application. And um, President Robinson adopted certain positions with then Prime Minister Pandey before the general election of 2001. Um, when the relationship between the two of them had deteriorated somewhat and he was refusing to act on his advice in respect of certain senatorial appointments to, to terminate and to appoint others. Uh, that, that started about January of 2000. And by the time you got to, and then he relented after a period of time and he, he acted on the advice and changed the senators. And then by the time you got to December of 2000, there was a general election and um, in the general election, the UNC won 19 seats and therefore had a majority of, out of the 36. Um, and Prime Minister Pandey at the time recommended seven persons who were defeated candidates to be appointed as senators and ministers. And President Robinson decided that he was not going to act on that advice, which created a standoff situation for 55 days. So that um, he eventually appointed everyone that Prime Minister Pandey wanted. I think the President wanted to make a point and the Prime Minister wanted to make a point, so they both made their point. It just took 55 days for the point <laughs> to be made. And um, that was the end of that. But I think the, 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 the issue in the 1818 tie in the December 2001 general election that was held, I think, on the 10th of December 2001, it, and it ended 1818, President Robinson uh, exercises powers on Christmas Eve um, because he is the, the, the president is the only one who can appoint a prime minister and it is a discretionary appointment and therefore in the discretion of the president he was of the opinion that um, Mr. Patrick Manning was more likely to command the support of a majority than Mr. Basil Pandey which is what it was and that 1818 situation from Christmas Eve of 2001 to the 5th of April 2002 when the parliament was convened was a very, very difficult period. The country survived it. Um, it was basically all the ministers were appointed on the 24th of December and the 26th of December 2001. Uh, so they all took ministerial oaths. When the parliament met on the 5th of April, they couldn't elect a speaker. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. And this went on over the weekend, uh, the 5th and the 6th. And the government simply could not get out of the sitting that they were in. And the prime minister advised the president to prorogue parliament, which was the only way to, to end the sitting. Mm -hmm. So parliament stood prorogued. Uh, and that's presidential power. But the president has that power, but he exercises it on the advice of the prime minister. Right. So yes, um, you know, the, the circumstances sometimes create the need for powers to be exercised in a particular way. Yeah. And then we, we can't forget the words of President Carmona when in his inauguration ceremony, when he talked about the powers that he has, that we may not think he, have, he has, and the powers that he doesn't have. Given all that has happened over the last few years, does the president really have certain powers to effect change that we may think necessary? Well, I think that in, in that particular context, that, that, that's, that part of his inauguration speech was something that um, a lot of people remember. But it, 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 it did not in any way change the character of the presidency because it's how you handle yourself in office. That is the key to the whole thing. Uh, the president can certainly delay things. He could take his time to, to sign legislation. He could take his time to make appointments or, or what have you. And, and therefore, in that context, um, delaying the power is, is what, is, delaying the exercise of power is, is where that gray area will exist. So I tender advice to you today and you know, two months from now, you, 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 you take action on it or, or whatever it is, much like what President Robinson did. Um, so there, there is a, a, an implicit delay because the system operates on the basis that the head of state will carry out the wishes of the executive of the day, and particularly the person who heads the executive, namely the prime minister. Um, when that does not happen, uh, there might be some other reason behind the scenes. But uh, that particular comment, um, does not in any way alter the presidency. He may have had that particular um, outlook, and the events of the last week and a half have shown that, you know, that, that power is not perhaps the way in which he conceived of it mm -hmm. uh, at that time. Yeah. Dr. Rambasad, how do you see the presidency and, the, and his role and function at this time? Do, is there a need for change or for reform as to what he should be able to do or shouldn't be able to do. I find it very instructive that you're using the pronoun him and his. And yes, and sorry, he. I should, yes, and, and I should, should say, say uh, her or the power that she would now have. And we should, yes. but in the constitution, the constitution is gender bias. The, the entire language of the constitution refers to men and institutions. It talks about his, him, and he in re reference to office holders, all the office holders across the board, even in the service commissions, um, in the parliament, mm. uh, and in, in the presidency. Um, so certainly, I think one of the things that should be brought sharply into focus now that we c have a female head of state is to look into that aspect of the gender bias in the, quest in the constitution. We have been trying to get some changes that in within that for a number of years it's been tabled to constitution reform committees over and over again um, and this is a constitution made in 1962 revised in in 1976 and with se several other revisions in between um, so now that we have a female president i think it does bring sharply into focus the language of the constitution one and two the implicit and and uh, gender bias that is built in within within not just the constitution but also within the system. When we're looking, I'm looking at the range of photographs that you're showing. There is gray, um, black, black and gray suits, and we hope that if a woman is going to add some color to color. that one. <laughs> um, but in relation to when you when we talk about power and uh, the notion of power and uh, um, how men and women handle power, um, for a long time in the gender movement in Trinidad we have been championing put a woman put a woman in the house so the house of parliament now we have a woman in the house of the pre the president's house um, how would she interpret those powers does she bring to the office some different concept of what power is and how you wield power and you how you manipulate power dr gani just explained how the previous presidents worked their understanding and interpretation of the term power. Mm -hmm. So this is something that I think we would be looking at very keenly. How would Justice Paula May Weeks 
um, as the first female president of Trinidad and Tobago be interpreting power from, from a, maybe a gender and gendered perspective and of, of course also bringing in her experience of working in the system, of working in these institutions, the so-called men and institutions, and, and, and how can she negotiate that space and make it more accessible to other women as well. Yes, and bring equity. Yeah. How do you think she could handle that, Dr. Gannon? Well, there is a, a, a debate about the use of gender-neutral language in legal drafting, and I think that uh, more and more you are beginning to see um, that there has to be a response in, in this context um, because what Dr. Rampasad is raising is an issue of legal drafting and how the Constitution is actually drafted and the language of the Constitution as well as in other statutes so that the, the, the issue of legal drafting and the use of gender neutral language is a debate that, that needs to be had and I think that you know societies are, are very far advanced that the traditional way of, 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 uh, of, of legal drafting has been to use he to cover she. And um, that, I think, in, in today's world of a different level of consciousness about gender bias, uh, I think that um, you know, that is a debate that whose time has come. And um, I don't know if the Law Reform Commission of Trinidad and Tobago will be given such a mandate, but that is really for a political directive to come from the government to the, the Law Reform Commission, let us say, um, to, to be able to start a process like that, or even to initiate a process whereby you begin to have legislation being drafted in that way, or some kind of other corrective measures being taken to bring gender neutral language uh, to a new level right. in terms of public affairs. Mm -hmm. If I may also jump in here, uh, when we talk about language, um, it, you see it's also implicit in there as a kind of mindset you know, um, and, and a cultural mindset and what is institutionalized in the country in terms of perceptions mm -hmm. and that kind of thing. Um, in, in culture studies, we see language bears culture yes. and, and language transmits that culture of how we perceive men, the roles of men and women in society. So it really is a crucial point in terms, it's not just a matter of the, the of how it looks and, and how it's, rep it's, it's, how it's represented right. and how we project in terms of what we are moving forward or moving into. Yes, because, and I guess because most of these positions were always male-dominated, but things are changing and evolving now. So that's where the change now has to come, where, you know, there, there is where women are now demanding equ equal treatment. Um, yeah, and, but also aligned to that, we, I, I think we have, um, and I would say it's tr we, we pretty much welcome, you know, having a female President, if I might give you a little anecdote, um, my niece was like about 10, one day we were chatting, and um, I asked her, what would you like to be when you grow up? And uh, at that time, um, President Hassan Ali had just come into office. Her, her sister was, had just started attending Naprima Girls High School. And um, Mrs. Hassan Ali, the first lady of the day was, a, a, a student which she was aspiring to go to that school as well and she she wanted to impress me so she wants to be the the, the leading woman in the country and she said oh i would like to be the president's wife <laughs> yeah <laughs> so so now we have we have lifted the bar well, a bit and, yes. and women and girls can aspire to be in the president the president yes? and not just the president's and, wife <laughs> and have, right so having said that i mean so so there's a lot of joy and there is a, a um a lot of optimism in terms of now that it opens up this fear in terms of expectations of women but having done that we who are working in terms of empowering women and i think we've done a lot of that in terms of a lot of groundwork in terms of opening up the spaces or trying to open up the spaces for women to occupy one of the, there's still a lot more work to be done in terms of how they now negotiate those positions in terms of how they move within the sphere of that and i think we've seen playing out in our own national community and elsewhere where the challenge the, the, the challenge is because now you're entering a sphere that is still pretty much i wouldn't say male dominated but the culture more, more than being male dominated it's the culture of the sphere is, is, is there's a certain mind, mindset that goes mm -hmm. with it. And how the women who 
a place there, how they occupy that, that space and how they use it, um, it it's going to be crucial. And when we look at the, the Constitution, for instance, in terms of how it set up the role, and Dr. Ghani has described some of that, how the, the roles of the presidents, it's pretty much as, as um, almost a rubber stamp. Everything is done in terms of on the advice of the Prime Minister, mm -hmm. and there isn't much, much room for negotiating that. Um, we are empowering women to not become the chorus girls and uh, the, the cheerleaders of, of, of other male leaders and that mm -hmm. kind of orientation. So how she carve out that space is very crucial and, she, and, and you know, what we'll be looking at. We have seen challenges to other women who have held leadership position and, and there isn't, you know, n not the adequate support systems and uh, that kind of thing that would help strengthen their mm -hmm. roles and in terms of what they want to do with carving out that. So um, it's going to be very challenging, I think, um, of how you negotiate that space, not become a chorus girl of the existing system and, and, and just a backup cheerleading, part of a cheerleading team. Um, and that we have seen in terms of the bravado that um, Dr. Ghani was talking about the President Robinson's move, um, Pre President Kamuna's speech. Mm -hmm. And in the end, they've all had to, as we say, boil down like Baji, right? Yes. <laughs> um, so what's, well, how, how is Justice Paula May Weeks going to use that space to one project? Maybe to change, is she going to use it to change how, how the perception of the role is of the President is? Or to just become that kind of chorus girl? Or, um, is she going to challenge? I mean, how, how is, is she going to challenge the space or and, and lift it or get her colleagues to lift the expectations of the yes. space as okay. well? Okay. We take a short break, but we'll certainly come back when we return. We take a look at President elect Madam Paula May Weeks. Madam Justice Paula May Weeks is set to become the first female president of Trinidad and Tobago. Having been the only nominee and approved by government and opposition members, Justice Weeks will take up her role today, Monday, 19th March, 2018. Justice Weeks began her career after receiving a Bachelor of Laws Honours and a Legal Education Certificate from the Hugh Whitting Law School in 1980 and 1982 respectively. She sought employment as a state counsel in the Office of the Director of Public Prosecutions, where she remained for nine years, after which she entered private practice, engaged chiefly in criminal trial and appellate work. In September of 1996, she was appointed a puny judge of the Supreme Court of Trinidad and Tobago's criminal jurisdiction, becoming the fifth woman to do so. This post was held until 2005, when she was elevated to the Justice of Appeal until retiring in 2016. Justice Weeks even briefly acted as the Chief Justice in 2012, as she was the most senior of the appellate judges in the jurisdiction. Her career, large as it is, extended to the wider Caribbean, where she became a fellow of the Commonwealth Judicial Education Institute and, most recently, a judge of the Turks and Caicos Court of Appeal. A trained, experienced judicial educator, Justice Weeks has also designed and delivered programs extensively in Trinidad and Tobago, the Organization of the Eastern Caribbean States, OECS, and Jamaica over the years. Now she crowns things off by taking up the post of the Office of the President, making history as the first woman to do so. The President is Head of State, and Executive Authority of Trinidad and Tobago is vested in them. They are also the Commander-in-Chief of the Armed Forces and the custodian of all state lands after consultation with the Solicitor General. The President appoints the Prime Minister, the Leader of the Opposition, Attorney General, Ministers and Parliamentary Secretaries. The nation welcomes Madam Justice Paula May Weeks as Trinidad and Tobago's sixth President of the Republic. Welcome back, and that was a brief insight into President-elect Madam Paula May Weeks. Well, Dr. Gandhi, we were talking about um, the, the President-elect being able to utilize that space. How is she going to utilize that space? And how is she going to um, carve the way for other women to achieve? Now, uh, Prime Minister uh, Dr. Keith Rowley, in his address to the Electoral College, had uh, saw her appointment and achievements as a signal to young people that they can also be the best they can be. 
is how much of her, where she is today, what she has achieved, will be, in fact, that kind of example to young people, to young women in particular, that, listen, the stars are the limit. It's, you know, you, the sky is the limit. Yes, I can, I can achieve just as much as anybody else. Well, I think that the, the first clue we'll get will be in her inauguration address. And uh, depending on how she constructs that, uh, we may be able to um, take from the narrative uh, various uh, clues as to what her thinking is with regard to certain aspects of the office. And then her own conduct in office and how she carries herself um, you know, different presidents have different ways in which they may telegraph certain things so that um, presidents, you know, Clark and Hassan Ali had a, a more reserved style uh, in which, in, in how they carried themselves. President Robinson was more obtrusive into the political arena. Uh, president Richards um, portrayed himself as a kind of people's president and mixed in all kinds of social gatherings and settings and went outside of the traditional uh, norm. President Carmona lost his temper at times in public with people and made comments about uh, the way that the media would handle things or other people would handle things. So he, he was somewhat short-tempered, whereas um, we'll want to see what uh, Madam Justice Paula May Weeks will be like. So every president has their own style in how they discharge the functions of the office and how they carry themselves um, with the, the powers that they have. So I'll start with the inaugural address and then we'll see how she conducts herself in office because mm -hmm. every president is going to have their style. Yeah. Yeah. Dr. Rampasad, how do you see her role now being much of an exemplar to young women? Yeah, um, I think it's going to be challenging for her. I, I, I have to say that because when if we look survey the landscape in terms of the president's past. And the, 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 the president, apart from well, the first two with Sir Ellis Clark and Justice Noor Hassan Ali, um, we see in, in terms of when, when, when there were challenges in terms of law. And, and, and we know that that's her area of expertise and it's been almost a singular focus mm -hmm. for her entire career. Uh, it, it, it hasn't been that where, where, where the strongman lawyer approach has, has been used within the space of the presidency have not very, been very successful. Mm -hmm. So for some, re for some reason, I, I think that uh, she would need to have to revisit approaches and really look at, l survey what, what's happening. When we look at, um, the, for, for instance, the last, the, the two first ladies that we've had who's made a significant difference in the sphere, which was um, Lady Hassan Ali mm -hmm. and Dr. Jean Richards. Um, I, I think in a lot of ways, they lifted the stature of the presidency. And she, in some public interviews, has said, you know, she doesn't, she, she, she doesn't have that advantage of having the, yeah. the two for the price of one kind of package, <laughs> yes, you know, a, pre yeah. a president's wife in, in, uh, in, in, on the wings. So, uh, and she, she also mentioned, and I think it, in, in looking at how, 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 do, how, how do women carve this space? And, and we have, I mean, when we, when we train women leaders and, and have these discussions in, in our discussion groups and things like that, um, it, we, we cannot undervalue the tea ceremonies <laughs> <laughs> and the cocktail parties. Yes. We have seen, and we, uh, we have seen how women can use these spaces, in fact, to carve out very, very progressive pathways for, for legislation, for policy, for all kinds of social, so, social change. Yeah. And uh, there are very important kinds of mechanisms. So maybe in terms of style, she would, she, she would need to examine, I mean, what kind of style she's going to adopt. Is it going to be the hard and fast legal positions that you've mm -hmm. had? I think she's been very much cocooned in a way because as a, as, as, as a, as a judge, you are in a kind of a fraternity. There are things like contempt of court, that people mm -hmm. can't step outside certain kinds of bounds. Dr. Hammond mentioned social media. Now you're open game. You draw before, and it's a different environment. Um, uh, it, it, it's open game in terms of social media. And I, I have to say that none of our public figures have demonstrated that they understand how to deal with this beast. Yes. Um, and Justice Paula Mew Weeks, coming from the background that she has, and I think it's been fairly cocooned. You, you, you're protected as a right. justice. Mm -hmm. Here you're not. Mm -hmm. And that's going to be challenging. Mm -hmm. She, one of the things that she actually pointed out that is going to be of immediate concern to her is youth and crime. Um, 
And she, as she said, with her career in criminal law, she cannot fail but to be concerned with young people and what position they will occupy in society. She seems to be quite concerned about that. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that, you know, that will be uh, something that she can communicate to the Prime Minister in the weekly meetings. And um, I, I, I don't know that, um, you know, she doesn't strike me as the kind of person who will come out and make public pronouncements on public policy to challenge the executive, mm -hmm. uh, which, which perhaps was a trend that started to develop uh, in, in terms of, of the presidency because the office of the president bears no political responsibility. That is a matter for the executive, so that um, I don't want to prejudge how she's going to handle it, um, but she has spoken about uh, some of the things that she is concerned about, and those are two items. Um, so I think it may start, first of all, with the private discussions with the prime minister on a weekly basis, and um, whenever she's required to consult the leader of the opposition with respect to certain positions and appointments and so on, some of that discussion may, may, may come up. Um, but I, I think the, the way she will discharge herself, I'm, I'm looking on very keenly to see how she's going to handle the office of the president um, and to create her own style now that we know that those are two of her passions. I, I would say it probably goes a little beyond policy and law. As we have seen in many ways, those have, have been failing us. Policy, we have policies that are being flouted, we have laws that are being flouted. And looking at the, the whole issue of, of youth and crime, um, when I, when, when, when I look at how, in terms of women, we, we, we look at women as the bearers of culture. And I have, or I have had an ongoing, in fact, my ongoing preoccupation is that if it is that we have women occupying more and more spaces, why, why isn't change happening much faster? Um, and is it that even though, well, they, we, women are carrying, I think, the burden of, um, the, the burden of tradition and culture and replicating those, that, that culture. And I think that that's one of the, the issues we have in terms of like when we think about denting domestic violence, for instance, mm -hmm. we have so many women in very empowered positions, independent, earning their own income, um, Hollywood stars and singers yeah. and what have you, and they're still battered and they stay in battered relationships and they return to them. Mm -hmm. uh, so how do, we, how do we change this fear? And, and if it is that women are the bearers of culture, and, and, and you, you have within, within us the capacity for cultural change. Why isn't that happening? Um, so so it, it, it goes beyond what we're doing about policy and what we're doing about law and more about what we're doing to change our environment and to change our expectations and our mindset and, and, and you know, how, how we carve out that space where young people can see themselves in, a, in, in another light. Than, than rather, you know, in, in terms of the gangsterism, in terms of a sense of hopelessness, a lack of a sense of future and that kind of thing. So it's really shaping that space and that kind of the, the, the projection of, of how do we create a kind of environment that make young people feel a sense of hope as well. And what can she do as, um, as president of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago? What are some of the things that she may be able to do outside the sphere of the, the legal aspects and so on, to bring about that change, um, if, especially with young people and young women? If we look, I would say in terms of one of our, our best practice examples, um, when we look at the send-off we had for Max Richards, for instance. Max Richards was a Trini, Trini to the bone. And I think that's what, that's what this country needs more than anything else. We need people to show that kind of commitment to nation first, rather than self or office or party or, or any of those things, or your, or, your, or your boys club or the girls club or, mm -hmm. or that kind of thing. We need, tr need trainees first of all. Um, and th that, that would spark. I remember that Kamona's first speech, that, mm -hmm. that sparked so much. People were looking forward to see him now so much hope. implement this, mm -hmm. you know, because it is kind of. There are things that need to be done, and we need to find a way to do it beyond the sphere of what, what, what the instruments before, before us think. I, I, I think a lot of what's within the Constitution, in a way, disempowers the society, it disempowers all the offices. You hear the Prime Minister talking about, oh, he has no powers to do this. And if, if the people at the highest level are, are talking and championing disempowerment, what does that leave for the youth? Um, it, 
she, in terms of how she project that role and how she engage the rest of the population, youth, women, men, you know, all, all the, and, and I, especially to the, that, that this challenge that we have of a very diverse society, a multicultural diverse society where everybody's looking for a piece of a pie and everybody feels disempowered. Everybody feels yeah. another group has won over them. It's a very challenging environment, but that is where I think, first of all, you have to be a trainee and you have to show that it's nation first above everything else. What do you think? I mean, I know that you said, Dr. Ghani, we will have to wait and see, mm -hmm. what, you know, coming out of her inauguration speech, what's the direction that she's planning to take. But just on the face of it, what do you think, um, and when you first heard that she um, had, had been selected as the, as the new president, what immediately did you think that she brings to the table, she would bring to the table and bring to the presidency? Well, the, 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 the profile information that I had on her was that she was a no-nonsense person. <clears throat> and I think that that's a good thing. But I think that she can perhaps make some contributions, putting law and policy and so on aside, <clears throat> in terms of, of, of the, the, the language. Um, I know Chris talked to you about the beginning about using he and so on and, and that mm -hmm. kind of, but then she's referring to Trinis and, and that is alienating in our country because it alienates everyone in Tobago and I think that she could perhaps start there by eliminating the word Trini from our uh, vocabulary, vocabulary unless we are speaking about Trinidad alone. Mm -hmm. We have before the parliament a Tobago autonomy bill and I think that one of the things that we need to look at in terms of language in our society is to eliminate the word Trini if we're talking about Trinidad and Tobago. I think that she as president could make a change right there. And I think that, that that's an area to start. Yeah, and I think I quite agree with you. And I, I think one of the elements of the diversity that we, we, we take for granted and we don't explore and, and, and try to understand is that relationship between Trinidad and Tobago. Mm -hmm. And we have seen too a lot of the, the grand charge and underground standing we've had with President Robinson, who came from Tobago, yeah. and now our current Prime Minister, who also is a Tobagonian, um, the, the sense of small island space and, and, and um, the sense of marginalization that, that, that comes from, fr from, from, from let's say, we, we, we're the smaller of the two, we've always been, you know, like the, the little Big sister, the, little sister. Well, it's not even a little sister, it's like the, it, it's like the, <laughs> the, the, the surrogate sister or something, you know, <laughs> the adopted sister. So, so yes, equal in that relationship. It's, it's been one of the challenges of the diversity we haven't fully explored. Um, along with uh, all the other elements, the rural, the rural communities, you know, we still have rural communities in Trinidad for a small island that ought to be very highly developed. We have very, we have areas that are largely neglected and remote and there's a different kind of culture that comes out of this area as well right. in, in themes of the sense of being alienated and being marginalized. We have to look at those um, and we've spoken about, of course, the gender issue as well. So. Yeah. It, before we end, and time is, yeah, I can't believe how, how fast time has gone by. What would you say of uh, the legacies that would have been left behind that President-elect um, Paula May Weeks could uh, capitalize on with our former presidents? I, I think the discussion of controversial matters behind closed doors and a little less um, obtrusion into the into the public space where delicate constitutional and controversial matters are concerned is, is one of the things because people uh, misinterpret uh, the signals around some of these things. And um, as President Carmona leaves office, he leaves behind a huge controversy raging inside of the judiciary. And, and we can't treat it as the elephant in the room because it is a serious matter. And that is one of the first things that uh, Madam Justice Paula May Weeks is going to have to uh, engage and I think dialing down the rhetoric, moving behind closed doors, sorting this out because when people see their presidents and their prime ministers and their chief justice and others out in the public domain in this kind of confrontational way, it is not very good imaging for the state and it is something that perhaps she may want to address as yeah. she assumes office. Okay. Dr. Rampasad? Yeah. In terms of imaging, yeah, um, certainly uh, I think maybe one of the things she'd probably want to look at, in it, given it's it's so challenging, is the social media issue. We have seen how, in fact, um, President Kamuna 
presidency was almost pulled down by social media because mm -hmm. he didn't, I think, and it's probably because he didn't know how to engage with the system yeah. and how he respond. I have seen in terms of, like, for example, uh, that's one of the first interviews that was made public with her, that she also seems to need some, you know, um, guidance understanding, and understanding and guidance in, in terms of, of how you negotiate social media because it is the future. I think none of our heads have shown that they understand how this demon works or how to, to use it or how to, to utilize it in terms of for, for national development. Uh, and there are many ways in which we can do that. Yeah. So certainly, and that is going to be crucial to her imaging. Yes, I, and yeah. I, I, I think you're absolutely right because even sometimes in the workplace, we still we don't understand how we or social media ought to function. And yes, at the level of the presidency, certainly that would, she would need some guidance there. Um, any closing comments, Dr. Ghani? Well, just to say that I, I wish the new president well as she embarks on her term of office. She has um, many challenges in front of her. And um, I, I think that um, I'm confident that she has the demeanor and the personality uh, and the um, mental fortitude to be able to address the challenges that are going to face her. Yeah, Dr. Ramsar? I think, um, yes, we wish her well, and she has a lot of well-wishers out there who are looking to support her. Um, she needs to, un to, to carve out, you know, have a support system and utilize that. It's not an easy space to occupy. Um, it's also not easy to be, you know, breaking new ground as well without that kind of support system in place. So we look forward to really good things coming out from Madam President. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Ghani. Thank you, Dr. Rampasad, for spending time with us this morning, helping us to better understand the role and functions of the President and, of course, looking ahead to what's to come with Madam President Paula May Weeks.